Well, my name is uh, Max Gardner III. I was born in 1945 right here in Shelby. Uh, my dad was uh, Max Gardner Jr. He was the uh, youngest son of Governor Gardner and Faye Gardner. He was born in uh, 1921. Um, my family has lived here since the 1840s. I'm, I've been a bankruptcy lawyer for 36 years, and I practice bankruptcy law right here in this house, the Waverly. Married and had three children. Uh, tell us a little bit about Webley House. Uh, Webley was built in 1852. Uh, Augustus Burton was a lawyer that actually built the house. The house was occupied by the Western Division of, of Grant's Army uh, in 1865 and actually appropriated by the United States government, taken over, and was a field hospital for the Union troops. And the story is that, that approximately 22 Union troops died in this house. Uh, there, there have always been uh, ghost stories and things of that that uh, have circulated over all the years about that. But we have about 20 graves out in Sunset Cemetery that are unmarked that uh, say the uh, the individuals buried there are Union soldiers, and those are the ones that, that uh, allegedly died here at Webley. And then it was uh, purchased at a public auction in 1871. And actually, um, Adelaide Austell Craver, who is the former president of First National Bank, her great uncle purchased the home, and they occupied it for probably 25 years. And then my grandfather's brother-in-law bought the home in 1905, and he actually added these twin front parlors that we're in right now, and the um, the three bay front, the uh, porta cashier, the carriage entrance on the left side, the uh, scamozzi capitals that are out front, and the columns, and then my grandmother's uh, father, Judge Webb bought the house in 1911 from his brother-in-law and it's been in the, the family ever since. It's so close to the center of town, uh, what do you think this house has meant in Shelby? What, what, what's its place? Well, I think it's kind of, you know, it's, it's probably one of the seventh or eighth uh, oldest remaining homes in Shelby. I think it's been a, you know, a centerpiece of uh, social and political life. Uh, for many, many years, and the so-called Shelby Dynasty uh, certainly started right here. The um, Shelby Dynasty was really uh, something that started with, with my grandmother's family. Uh, her father was a lawyer and uh, the district attorney for Western North Carolina for 20-some years and then a Superior Court judge. And her uncle, my grandfather's brother, who lived right next door, uh, E.Y. Webb was uh, also a lawyer and a, a federal a member of Congress back in, say, 1905 to 1917 when uh, President Wilson appointed him as a federal district court judge. So the, the Webb family was really, uh, you know, one of the premier families here in Shelby at the turn of the last century, not, not the one we just did, but back in 1900. And uh, my grandfather uh, always said that the best uh, personal and political decision he ever made was marrying a uh, Faye Lamar Webb. So uh, he pretty much married into the family. And uh, that's how he got involved in politics. What, by way of getting into explaining the, the Shelby dynasty, why would that have been such an advantageous marriage? Well, the, the Webb family was the most prominent uh, political family you know, in this part of the state at the time, my grandfather, uh, they got married in 1907. So uh, at, at that point, uh, E.Y. Webb was a member of Congress, and I think we had five Congress representatives, members of the Congress at that time. Uh, we have 17 or 18 right now. So uh, other than two U.S. senators, being a member of Congress was a very special position. And his father-in-law was... Uh, a Superior Court judge, and back then um, a Superior Court judge had jurisdiction over like 25 counties. So there were just about um, 
10 or 11 Superior Court judges in the whole state. Today, we probably have 130 or 40 Superior Court judges. So that was a well-established political family. My grandfather had uh, graduated from NC State. Uh, he took a, an engineering degree, intended to go into the textile business. Um, he played football. He got a football scholarship, and that's how he got to NC State. He was from a very uh, poor family, not, not uh, a wealthy family at all. Um, once he finished at NC State, he taught there for two years in, in the chemistry department. And then he um, got a scholarship to play football at UNC. And this was before the NCAA uh, enacted the rules on how long you could play college sports. So he, uh, he went to law school at UNC, and he's the only person in, uh, and I think this is probably the best example of his political um, genius, that he's the only person that was, that's ever been captain of the football team at NC State and captain of the football team at UNC. Uh, his only condition on playing at UNC was he would not play in the UNC Carolina uh, State football game, which he didn't the one time they played. Um, is the, I think a Gardner Webb must come out of these two families. Right, this this house is uh, is named Webley, and and that was named by my grandmother uh, in honor of her father. When when he died in 1932, she inherited the house along with her sister, uh, who lived here, Madge Webb, who uh, who never married. So Madge and my my grandmother owned this home uh, from 1932 to her death, and uh, Gardner Webb is is named in honor of my, my grandfather and grandmother. That's the gardener, the web, that's where that comes from. And that was based on um, some interest he took in the school in the 1940s and uh, you know made some financial contributions to the school. And so they, they changed the name in, in his honor. I think it was Boylan Springs Junior College before that. Well, I'd love to hear more about uh, Omax Gardner, the governor. What motivated him? Well, I got to glance at some of the newspaper columns and back in the, in the back there, and it sounded like a progressive person in a in a conservative state somehow. Well, you know, he, there's a there's a uh, a new uh, uh, biography out on the governor that uh, uh, cast him as uh, the lib liberal governor in a progressive state, and I really think that uh, describes. Him more than anything else, uh, a lot of people forget that he was lieutenant governor from 1916 to 1920. Um, you know, during that time, he was uh, very uh, influential in the uh, suffrage movement to give women the right to vote. Uh, he actually cast the vote in the state senate that uh, passed that amendment. It was a tie vote among the senators, so the lieutenant governor got to vote in 1919, he, he passed the vote that cast the uh, uh, deciding vote that uh, that amendment got out of the Senate. It did not get out of the State House, so it was defeated in the State House, and then uh, I think three months later uh, passed in Tennessee, and that was enough states to make it a constitutional amendment. He uh, was a strong supporter of uh, the rights of African Americans uh, to vote, uh, personally registered thousands of African-American voters himself uh, in the 1910 to 1920, 1920 to 1930 period. Um, his textile mill that he owned was the first textile mill in the South to employ African-American workers at the same rate, uh, pay rate as, uh, as uh, white workers. Um, you know, he, when he was governor, he, uh, enacted uh, the first workers' compensation law, reorganized state government, uh, created the Consolidated University of North Carolina, uh, had the uh, state take over all primary and secondary roads, created the uh, North Carolina Highway Patrol, uh, had the state take over the payment of all teachers in North Carolina. It used to be a county-by-county county thing to try to equalize education opportunities in the state. Um, so, I mean, I'm very proud looking back, uh, you know, 100 years 
to, to think of some of the things that he did. Uh, it makes me very proud to be uh, his grandson. And probably one of the nastiest uh, political races in, in North Carolina history was in 1920 when he ran for governor against uh, Cam Morrison in the Democratic primary, and he lost in a runoff by 97 votes, which is less than one vote per county. Didn't ask for a recount, but uh, he was um, portrayed by Cameron Morrison as uh, uh, a pro-Negro, uh, pro-women's rights advocate. And there were some extremely nasty uh, political ads and brochures and placards and things like that that were put out in that campaign. So if, if people think campaigns are nasty today, they should go back to 1920 and look at that one. It was extremely... Uh, um, bad, let me say that. But then he ran unopposed in 1928. It's the only time in North Carolina history that uh, anybody has run for governor and had no uh, competition in the Democratic primary. The governor faced a lot of issues uh, when he was elected in, uh, in 1929. Um, one of his uh, close advisors during that period was uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was governor of New York at the same time that my grandfather was governor of North Carolina. But, um, you know, I remember a letter that he, that he wrote to my grandmother that said uh, when, when the stock market crashed in 29, uh, you know, why did I want to be governor uh, in the first place? Because we had banks that were failing uh, all over the state, businesses that were failing. Uh, we didn't have any uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to take over banks, so if they failed, everybody lost all their money. Um, Friends of, of, of his were losing everything they had in the stock market. And, uh, you know, the country was uh, in a similar condition in many ways that we find ourselves in today. Uh, certainly the, the recession we're in today is nothing like the recession uh, or depression that we had in 29 to, to really uh, 1952. I mean, the economy never re recovered until way after World War II. I think the... Um, the unrest uh, was, was a big issue. I mean, there was a lot of concern that uh, there were so many people that, uh, you know, were, were hungry, that didn't have any food, didn't have any income. We didn't have a food stamp program. We didn't have a Social Security program. We didn't have unemployment insurance. We didn't have any of that. And um, many of the, the textile workers who were laid off uh, at various places throughout the state during that time period uh, we're not, uh, we were not a unionized state at all. There, there were no textile mills that were unionized anywhere in North Carolina. And the unions uh, moved in pretty quick in 29 and 30, 1929 and 30, to try to unionize the textile workers. And there was great resistance um, to that movement from the textile owners. And that was probably one of the most difficult uh, times of uh, the governor's uh, years as governor, dealing with that that unrest and the uh, the Lori Mill strike in Gastonia was the, more, the, the most violent. Uh, he actually had to call out the National Guard to come in and uh, try to get things back to normal. There were, there were people that were shot and killed by uh, Gaston County police officers. Uh, Gaston, the Gaston County Sheriff was actually shot and killed by one of the, uh, the protesters. So, um, the governor made a special effort, though, here in Cleveland County that had more textile mills than any other county in the state at that time to, to make sure that, I um, mean, he personally came to the Cleveland Cloth Mill, the Dover Textile Mill, uh, you know, all the textile mills in this area, and personally met with the workers um, to try to, to make sure that kind of uh, issue didn't happen here. So we were very fortunate that it didn't. The incident in Gastonia was something that, uh, that I know he regretted that there was people that were actually lost their lives during that time period. But um, some people criticized him for calling out the guard. Uh, some didn't, but he felt like he had to do something to restore order. So that was, that was his most difficult decision in terms of a law and order type decision while he was governor. I'm just curious, did the uh, depression make it... Uh easier or more challenging to initiate all those, those governmental reforms that it seemed like? I, you know, I think he probably could not have done it but for the, the Depression. Uh, what he, he did in 
1929, she uh, uh, engaged the Brookings Institute, which is still in Washington, to do a, a study of North Carolina government and uh, to determine how they could reduce cost and save money and consolidate uh, governmental functions. And he pretty much got the General Assembly to enact almost everything the Brookings Institute had recommended. And I, I don't think that would have happened but for the, uh, the economic times. For example, there was uh, great resistance to consolidate uh, North Carolina State Women's College in Greensboro and the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill into one consolidated university system. Um, and, and I mean great political opposition to that. They're, they're very strong alumni groups uh, for all those institutions. And, you know, now we have uh, 16 uh, institutions in it. And, and the California system that, that uh, people talk about today, their consolidated system, is really based on the North Carolina uh, system. So, uh, you know, the biggest award the university still gives every year is the Omax Gardner Award to the um, professor in the system that made the greatest contribution to uh, human progress. And that's, that's given every year in his honor, uh, every May. So uh, he's recognized as the, uh, the father of the, uh, the greater University of North Carolina system. So in terms of education, I think that was, uh, you know, his, his greatest uh, accomplishment. But the, the book that's out now uh, on Governor Gardner as the liberal politician that saved the state, that's the name of the book, um, the writer says that if, if the governor came back today and, and went to Raleigh and started looking at state government, that would be pretty much the same as it was when he left uh, the governorship in 1932. We really have not changed the organizational structure. I think we probably need to, to make some changes, but, but the uh, you know, progressive, far-reaching kind of changes he made have, have been in place now for you know, almost 80 years. So I think that's a testament to, to what he did. And I think he would say if it wasn't for the Depression, uh, many of those things couldn't have been done. Tell me what you can about the Shelby Dynasty and why that term came to pass and stuck and how it's regarded by uh, those in and those who had the observant, you know, know uh, who were not <laughs> inside that circle. Well, I, th I think it started with the, uh, you know, with the Webb family and uh, my grandfather, uh, probably his best political decision really was to marry uh, Faye Lamar Webb. Um, he then, uh, you know, ran for the state senate. Then ran for lieutenant governor in 1961. Uh, ran for governor in 1928 again after he lost in 1921. Uh, that was a difficult uh, campaign in 1920 because uh, 1928 because Al Smith was the uh, Democratic nominee for president, the first Catholic that that ever ran for president, and that was not uh, uh, well received in the South. So the governor was, uh, was up against uh, a national ticket that was not, that didn't have any coattails, uh, so to speak. Uh, after he was uh, governor, because of his relationship with, uh, with Governor Roosevelt, he uh, decided to, to go to Washington and start a, a law firm up there, Gardner, Marston, and Rogers, and you know, became one of the top lobbyists uh, with the uh, FDR administration. And there's a letter I've got back uh, on the wall that while he was governor, he, he wrote a letter to, to then Governor Roosevelt and basically said what this country needs is a new deal. And many people say that, uh, that Roosevelt got the idea for the new deal from, from that correspondence with Governor Gardner. But uh, he pretty much uh, had a chance to pick who his successor was going to be as governor still had control over the Democratic Party after he left in 32. Back then, the governor could only serve one term. Uh, and then uh, his brother-in-law, who was uh, Clyde Huey, married his sister, uh, Bess Gardner. And the governor's mother had died when, when he was about uh, three or four years old. And really, Bess, uh, his sister, had pretty much raised him uh, from birth. So he was kind of like a sister-mother figure to him, and she married Clyde Huey. 
Clyde Huey is the only person who has ever been a member of the North Carolina State Senate, the North Carolina State House. He's been a United States Senator. He's been a member of, of Congress, a member of the House, and he's been governor. Uh, so he was the governor from 1936 to 1940. Uh, so obviously with your brother-in-law being governor, uh, that, that adds some uh, uh, mystique, I guess, or some idea that there is control, and, and really pretty much controlled North Carolina politics until his death in 1947. Well, where did the term Shelby Dynasty come from? Who first coined it, and how did it come to stick? I really don't know who first coined it, but it, it came from the fact that uh, the, the governor and his brother-in-law, Clyde Huey, uh, you know, pretty much were back-to-back -back governors of North Carolina, both from Shelby. Uh, Clyde Huey lived right here in Shelby his whole life, just like uh, the governor did. Uh, and, you know, Shelby is not uh, the biggest uh, municipality in the state of North Carolina. I mean, we're probably, um, you know, not even in the top 50 in terms of population. And, and back in the 30s and 40s, I'm sure we weren't uh, anywhere close to being in the top 50. So to have a small town in the western part of the state, uh, to have two governors in a period of uh, 12 years, uh, meant that somebody uh, in Shelby had uh, a lot of influence in the Democratic Party. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's pretty much how it got started. But, you know, the Webb family was, was very influential. Uh, E.Y. Webb was a U.S. congressman when Clyde Huey uh, left the governorship. He ran for the United States Senate and won, so he was one of our state's United States senators. So you had, um, you know, my grandmother's uncle as a U.S. congressman. You had her uh, husband as a governor and a former lieutenant governor, and uh, you had her, her brother-in-law as uh, a governor and United States senator. So... Um, I think that's how it got started. Now, who started it, I don't know. Uh, and how it got started, I don't know. But uh, there was some substance behind the, uh, the term Shelby Dynasty, no question about that. Well, you know, when I was, uh, was in uh, grammar school and, uh, and uh, junior high school here in Shelby, I would, I would come up to this house as much as I could, mainly because my grandmother was, uh, quite frankly, addicted to Coca-Cola's. And um, she would drink three or four of these little eight-ounce bottles of Coca-Cola's a day. And if I got to come up here and talk to her after school, if I brought her a Coca-Cola up to her room, I would get one. So uh, that was the incentive for me to come up here and, uh, and talk to her, but, but mainly to listen to, uh, to her tell stories about, uh, you know, my grandfather in politics and, uh, and President Roosevelt and uh, you know, President Truman and, and Bess Truman were, were very close friends uh, of theirs. Uh, the, the number one contact that, uh, that my grandfather had in Washington was uh, Stuart Symington, who was a senator from, from Georgia. And, you know, just to, to listen to stories about, uh, about those people um, was, was the things I liked to listen to. And she would tell me stories about how they would... Uh, uh, Owen Mull was another uh, sort of member. He was the Speaker of the House in the North Carolina legislature, another member of the, the Shelby dynasty, and actually uh, a relative of my, my own mother, uh, who, who was Sarah Mull Gardner. Uh, she was related to, uh, to Owen Mull. So my dad was sort of trying to, I think, follow my grandfather's footsteps in marrying in somebody that, uh, that was involved in politics or whose family was. So, uh, you know, they would, they would sit in the, uh, the room right over here uh, that, that turned into my grandmother's bedroom downstairs after my grandfather's death, but uh, that was the room where a lot of political decisions were made with, uh, you know, cigars and bourbon and uh, uh, a lot of talk about uh, who should be the next uh, this or who should be the next that. And uh, it was, it was uh, very interesting to me to hear the, the inside comments that they would, they would have about certain people in, in North Carolina political history and uh, uh, stories they knew about this person or that person. So I always enjoyed that. And then uh, Lee B. Weathers, who 
uh, owned the Shelby Star. Actually, Clyde Huey at one time was the owner of the uh, Shelby Star, and uh, that's how he got started. Uh, but Lee B. Weathers was really the person that, that made the star what it was, and I think he wrote a book in uh, the early 50s, and it may have made reference to the Shelby dynasty. It was a history of Cleveland County, but he used that term in there, and, and the term was well known by that time. Right. And so, and then the graciousness of your grandmother, and you know, she was so bright, so well educated, and such a bon vivant. I mean, there's just it, there could be some essence of her as yeah. well, as his partner, and some of their Washington story. Right. Too. Right. That's very much connected. Um. Yeah. Well, during you know during the time my, my grandfather was in Washington, which was really. 1932 until 1947. Um, he really was the first true lobbyist uh, with Gardner Marston and Rogers. Fred Marston was his partner. And uh, he made a, a deal with uh, President Roosevelt that as long as I'm a lobbyist, I'm not going to be involved in your administration. And uh, he was asked many times to, to be involved in that administration. Uh, during those years, they had a suite in the Mayflower it was uh, on the seventh floor. Uh, the number was 777. And uh, seven was the governor's favorite lucky number. And that was the reason he picked that suite. Um, just as a sidebar story, that, that's the same suite that, uh, that Governor Elliot Spitzer was called in with uh, uh, <laughs> uh, a woman that he shouldn't have been with that cost him the, the governorship in New York several years ago. Uh, which I found kind of ironic. I, I don't think anything went on like that while the governor lived there. Uh, you know, my, my, my grandfather's biggest ally, and, and he admitted this time and time again, was my grandmother. Uh, she was uh, a person who was, you know, as much at ease with uh, talking to a group of mill workers here in Shelby as she was talking to the Pope or the, uh, the Queen of England. It, it just didn't make any difference. Or President of the United States. She had a, a special quality that not many people have to do that. And she was also uh, uh, an expert at remembering people's names and faces. And um, my grandfather relied on her at almost every uh, uh, event he went to to make sure that she would identify the right people for him. And uh, that's a, a talent. The only person I've ever uh, known that was better than my grandmother is uh, is President Clinton, who I got to meet uh, first time in 1987 at an uh, event in Washington. Uh, the Democratic National uh, Committee had an event there, and I was general counsel for the Democratic Party of North Carolina. And President Clinton had uh, had memorized everybody's name and their spouse's name and their children's name in advance. I understood he did this at most uh, events he went to and, and memorized their pictures. So, you know, when, when he comes up to you as governor of Arkansas then, but, but says, Max, how you doing? It kind of takes you back and then he says, how's your wife Victoria doing? And how about you've got three children, is that right? Max, Webb, and Sarah. Uh, that kind of stuff uh, is, is, is stuff you don't forget. So that was the kind of thing my grandfather relied on my grandmother to do. Um, during uh, the Truman administration, he uh, he stopped uh, being a lobbyist and, and agreed to uh, to be involved in the Truman administration. And he was Under Secretary of the United States Treasury under President Truman and uh, Chairman of the Board of War Mobilization. Before that, uh, his favorite uh, thing to do at at parties was to give uh, uh, every guest a newly minted uh, U.S. dollar. So while he was Under Secretary of the Treasury, uh, that was his sort of calling card. He would go to an event and give everybody a, a brand new uh, dollar that just came out of the, uh, the federal printing office for the Treasury. Uh, his last official uh, position with the Truman administration was uh, 
ambassador to Great Britain. Uh, he uh, was appointed by President Truman and confirmed by the Senate in January of 1947 and uh, went to many, many parties and actually died at the St. Regis Hotel in New York City the night before they were to, to sail to England. So although he was uh, officially appointed, confirmed by the Senate, uh, sworn in, he never had a chance to actually uh, uh, get to Great Britain. Well, yeah. That, stuff recently about my, my grandfather was uh, was a lobbyist for uh, Southern Railway Company, and uh, Southern Railway actually uh, gave them a, a personal car uh, to travel back and forth to Shelby because they would come back on a regular basis here to Webley and. Uh, if they went to the uh, Kentucky Derby or, or, or wherever, they would obviously take that, that special car that was assigned to him. He did not own the car or buy the car, but that was uh, an incident of him being a lobbyist for Southern Railway Company uh, to do that. I think one of the, uh, one of the funniest stories uh, about that car is when, when the governor died in, in 1947, uh, they came back down in that in that car uh, and brought the body back here for the funeral that was here in Shelby, and then the car went back to Washington, so they took it back to to D.C. Uh, there was some concern that that President Truman was not going to be able to come to the funeral, and in fact, he had sent uh, regrets to my grandmother that he was not going to be able to come to the funeral. Um, sometime the night before the funeral, Truman decided that he in fact would come. And, of course, they didn't have Air Force One or anything like that in 1947. So President Truman and a number of senators and congressmen and members of the administration came down to Shelby in that car and several others and uh, stopped in Kings Mountain, which was the nearest uh, southern stop at that time, about 12 miles from Shelby, and took a motorcade, which back then was probably about seven cars and two police officers, uh, from Kings Mountain to Shelby, and when President Truman got to this house, uh, nobody knew he was going to come. Nobody knew he was supposed to come. Nobody thought he was going to come, and he came in the uh, the back door of the Webley, and, and nobody was there, uh, so he started wandering around the house and went upstairs, and uh, Ezra Bridges, who was probably one of the most famous uh, African-American uh, people ever in Cleveland County or maybe in North Carolina or, or throughout the country was actually here with my grandmother and had taken um, her breakfast tray to her room and was taking it out of her room and when she opened the door with the breakfast tray ran smack in to President Truman and uh, threw the tray up in the air uh, which caused all the dishes to break and said uh, Jesus Christ is the president and my, my said that very loud. My grandmother came out out of the room, still in her nightgown. Hair was not fixed or anything like that. And I uh, was face to face with President Truman and said that was the most embarrassing moment of her life. She was someone who would uh, would not go to the grocery store unless everything was just perfect. Yeah, yeah. We've we've actually had uh, two presidents. Uh, when when Franklin Roosevelt was president, uh, my grandfather had a house at Lake Lure, and, and uh, President Roosevelt had this, the summer White House in Warm Springs, Georgia. And uh, my grandfather had uh, tried to get Roosevelt and, and uh, his wife to, to stop by Shelby and see their home in Lake Lure. So I think in um, maybe 1931, um, uh, 32, President Roosevelt uh, actually stopped in Shelby and uh, there, there's a humorous story uh, about that. Uh, they went to Lake Lure, uh, and President Roosevelt got to see the home in Lake Lure, and when they were coming back through Shelby, they were going to have a motorcade, and they thought that the motorcade was going to come through on Warren Street, but, but the, the motorcade actually came through on Marion Street, so everybody was lined up on Warren Street, and as the motorcade came through town, it looked like there was nobody there to greet the president, and finally somebody realized he was on the other street. So 
thousands and thousands of people were running across the court square to get on uh, Marion Street to see the motorcade, and people were were falling down and running into each other and, and everything like that. And uh, the real reason the motorcade got on the wrong street is as they were coming into Shelby, on the western part of Shelby, uh, President Roosevelt uh, needed to go to the bathroom. So they had to stop the motorcade for the president to, to go out and go to the bathroom, and uh, which he did. And when they got back in, the, the highway patrol got on the wrong street. Uh, uh, got a little confused, and that's how that happened. But uh, Roosevelt did come here, and then, of course, President Truman was here for uh, the funeral in 1947. Every governor of North Carolina since 1900, including the two Republican governors, had been in this house at least once, except Governor Easley. Governor Easley is the only governor who has not been in this house since, uh, since 1900. And I invited the two Republicans. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, what would be your take on the uh, Texas story? We've heard from a really great array of, of uh, people who've had it affect their lives, and uh, it's from Bull Weevil till now. It's a, it's a story that's not left the you know that's been a challenge for the county, and yeah. the, the one that uh, Texas defined the area so much, and especially when Earl Scruggs was was young and worked in Millie Mill. Um, what's your t what's your take on that story? Well, you know, it's an industry that, that, that is gone. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's an industry whose, whose time has passed. Uh, you know, it's moved on to, to Mexico and, and now to China and Southeast Asia. Um, and it's something that, that uh, you know, has happened in the last uh, 15 years. One of the, the, the most rewarding cases that I've ever had as a lawyer was when the Shelby Mill Company closed, uh, closed without notice uh, at all. And the workers went to work one morning, and the gates were closed and locked. And uh, we actually represented um, all the textile workers, some 550 workers, and 13 of them put the company into an involuntary Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Uh, actually, 13 workers that I represented filed an involuntary bankruptcy against Shelby Mill, and we actually uh, attacked the... Uh, the hedge fund that, that really owned the mill. The hedge fund had bought the mill really to, uh, to try to extract the last dollar of value from the, uh, the workers and the equipment and had no intention of ever uh, operating it uh, as a full service industry again. And we were able to settle that case for uh, uh, around $25 million. And uh, we were able to get uh, thousands and thousands of dollars for all those 548 workers, and and during during the course of that case, um, you know, every time we went to court, I uh, really and truly felt like my grandfather was with me uh, because that was the kind of person he was. He was he was someone who was was always for the workers. Uh, for example, when he got the legislature as governor to enact the workers' compensation law. Before then, if you were injured on, work, on, on a work-related job, you had to hire a lawyer and sue your employer, just like you have to do if you're in an auto accident. And many of the, the injured workers could not afford to hire a lawyer. Uh, the lawyer would get a percentage uh, of whatever settlement they got. They had to prove the employer was at fault, and they were not at fault even at 1% for their injury. So, um, you know, I think everything that, that he did uh, was was something to protect the workers, and his concern was always, uh, you know, with the employees. Uh, in fact, uh, Cleveland Textile Mill had the highest hourly rate for any textile mill in North Carolina, and I think his decision to hire African American workers, uh, believe me, the governor was not um, um, somebody that was loved by other uh, owners of textile mills in North Carolina. Uh, mainly for raising wages uh, when they felt like he shouldn't uh, and for hiring African-American workers when they felt like he shouldn't do that and for uh, passing a workers' compensation law. Uh, the, the industry was certainly against that. So, you know, I think it's, it's been a big part of this county. I can remember when we used to have uh, uh, at the square every year when the cotton crop came in who was able to produce the biggest bale 
uh, would, would get a, an award and then who could produce the most cotton per acre, the number of bales per acre, that would be another thing that was given. So, you know, textiles was uh, the heart and soul of this, of this community. And, and at one time, Cleveland County produced more cotton than any state, any county in the entire state. I think we were the number one county for production of cotton in North Carolina. And the, the economy here, if you go back and look, you know, to the 1870s, 80s, 90s, all the way up to, uh, you know, the 1980s and 90s, cotton was, uh, was king in terms of uh, agricultural crop and cert certainly in terms of an economic production crop. Cotton was the number one thing. And I'm sure if, if my grandfather came back today and saw all these empty mills, uh, everywhere in this county, uh, he would be absolutely shocked to see what had happened if he knew that uh, how these jobs had been taken offshore and overseas. Um, he would be even more concerned and upset about the situation. Well, you know, the future is, the, you know, the, the thing that I think people have to understand is uh, this is not like going to McDonald's and, and ordering, a, you know, a burger or, or a coffee. Uh, this is not going to happen overnight. This is a, a long process. Uh, this whole country is is really in the same situation that Cleveland County is in, in my opinion. We've, we've outsourced uh, so much production work. We've outsourced so much, uh, you know, technical work, so much clerical work to other countries that, that we've got to bring it back to this country. We've got to bring, um, people have got to start making things again. Uh, and not just having call centers or computer centers or technical centers. But, but I'm encouraged about, you know, what our community leaders are doing, not just in Cleveland County but throughout the state, to bring in, uh, you know, high-tech industries uh, here in North Carolina. The, you know, this is not something that this is a long-term project, and I think that's what everybody's got to understand, that uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, for example, Google has... has is building a, a, a very big uh, computer tech center up uh, in uh, Marion that is, you know, just uh, 40 miles from here, uh, the adjacent county. Uh, and I think we're seeing things like that come here, uh, new industries coming here. It's going to take time. Uh, we're not going to have uh, an industry that comes in like, I remember when PPG first came here in 1957 or 58, uh, you know, they brought uh, 3,000 jobs to this county. When Fiber Industries then came here in, in the early 60s, uh, they bought 3,500 jobs. I don't think we're going to have anything like that, but we're, you know, it's, this is going to be a piecemeal thing. And I think this is a growth area. Uh, people that I meet all over the country, and I do seminars all over the country, they uh, rank North Carolina as one of the top three or four places to live in the United States. And, you know, my grandfather uh, coined the, the phrase variety vacation land. That was something he did when he was governor because we've got, you know, the mountains, we've got the, the, the Piedmont, we've got the foothills, we've got the coast, we've got the Outer Banks, uh, we've got islands uh, in the Outer Banks. Uh, and so we have a lot to offer here. Um, and and that, I think that's what people are looking for that are uh, involved in new businesses or, or growing or expanding current businesses is what kind of quality of life are we going to have for our employees. And I think that's the real advantage we have here in North Carolina is we have a special quality of life that's still here. And then, then we have a history. Uh, you know, we're one of the original 13 colonies. The history we have down east in some of our cities is just uh, fabulous. We've got a great history here in Cleveland County. Um, you know, people like, like Earl Scruggs and, and Don Gibson, uh, two of the, the greatest uh, country artists and bluegrass uh, artists in the history of this country are from right here in this county. And, and so we're trying to take advantage not just of our political history but our cultural history and just the general environment that we have here. Uh, this is a place that if I was uh, 25 years old and had a family that I would want to come to. Uh, you know, it's a small town in one way, but uh, we're very close to, to Charlotte. Uh, it takes me 35 minutes to get from the Webley to the Federal Courthouse in Charlotte. 
uh, even less time to get to the airport that serves the whole United States. I can take a direct flight to anywhere. So, you know, I, I'm very positive about where we're going. I think uh, we've got to have patience, and uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but uh, I'm confident it's going to happen.